Hi everyone, my name's Nat and welcome to this week's webinar. Today we're going to be looking at the pathology of autism. I'm from a lovely organization called Exceptional Individuals who support neurodiverse people into the workplace as well as organizations to help them be more inclusive. I am the head of community, which essentially means I do fun webinars each week. I also get to train organizations. Now, today's session is based a lot on my research from doing my master's in neuroscience, but also lived experience and personal research. Everything has been cited and referenced, so please do go into further research if you want to know more. A quick disclaimer, one, I'm not a doctor, and two, I've had to simplify everything dramatically in order to make it accessible for everyone. So don't take everything I say as 100% but more as the overall gist. And if there's things that you want to look into more, take a note on the reference that is on each slide. Ooh, nice, we've got April here. Want to learn a bit more about the subject today? Hi, April. As April, April is help filming with us today, which is great, and doing all the editing. Though, as an organization, we support everything around neurodivergence, we are predominantly focusing on autism today. What is autism? Where does it come from? Who even are you autism? Well, <laughs> spoiler, we do not know, but we have a few hunches, hypotheses, and guesses that we're going to be exploring today. Here's our lovely team. As I said, you've got myself in the chat. You've also got April. Yes, <laughs> sorry, April, I couldn't find you for a sec. Now, the last one we did was on schizophrenia, and we looked at the relationship between schizophrenia and dopamine and glutamate. Who is the key culprit here? Well, truth be told, dopamine is definitely one of the main reasons for schizophrenia, but it doesn't tell the whole story. There's more to it than meets the eye. So maybe glutamate is one we should be looking at. But you might think, how does that relate to neurodivergence? Well, all of these things are quite similar in terms of how they originate, but maybe one or two little things might go skew or different along the line, which can have dramatic different things. So autism, pathology. Wow, that is a big word. Pathology. Okay, that obviously needs a little bit of breaking down. I don't know if you're like you when I first started researching this subject, who knows what it is? It's actually not as complicated or as scary as it sounds. I'll be breaking it down momentarily. So just so we are all on the same page about what we can be expecting today, we need to know that autism is tied to brain development. It is a neurodevelopmental condition. And we're going to be learning about how do we even know that? Because that is quite important in understanding what autism really is. What is the actual origin? And for the next month, we are going really deep down that rabbit hole to hopefully find an answer. We also know that genetics, our DNA, help us understand ASD. It's still rather mysterious to us, but it's definitely genetic based. That's not to say that environmental factors don't also play a key part, but genetics is definitely one to keep an eye on. And we're also going to be looking at cellular and synaptic theories explaining ASD. What do I mean by that? Well, cellular, just what's in your brain and synaptics, the things in your brain, the little tail ends. We know about neurons. We know about the, the synapses and at the end of the synapse, is essentially where we're going to be looking at. If you notice, that's the problematic area in ADHD as well, and schizophrenia. So you can see how the synapse has a lot to answer for, but we're going to explain this even further. Now, first off, what is autism spectrum disorder? Now, again, this might seem a simple answer for some of you, but actually we don't know. So in your mind, what is it? Maybe you want to say what characteristics it is. Maybe you want to say what it is from a science perspective. Maybe you want to do it from, I don't know, a movement perspective and what it means for you in other concepts. We are still defining exactly what it is. Again, in only 2013, we switched it all around before, before it was just like, you know, autism, Asperger's. Now we've got different. It's always changing. Okay, we've got difficulties slash differences with how we view and interact with the world that is very much a physical view of it. That is what it looks like. Why? Why are there difficulties? Why are there differences? What is happening in our brain, which means that we respond different 
to different inputs and stimuli. Finding social interactions hard. True. But don't other conditions make social interactions hard as well? What about anxiety? What makes anxiety different from autism? We've got brains don't process information the same. Yeah, but why? We know if it's to do with the synapse and how it works with neurotransmitters, why is it not the same as ADHD? Why are those two separate conditions? Why do things the right way and the rest of the world are lunatics? That could possibly be the answer. Rich and sometimes overwhelming in a world from stimuli. Hopefully you get to see where the point I'm getting from. We know what autism looks like. We know that so many people act in a certain way and we've grouped it in order to hopefully have a way of supporting people and giving context to why we are the way we are. But that doesn't really explain how or really why. And that is where we're going down today. Oh, Louise is not sure if it should be called a disorder. Well, that's the thing, Louise. We don't like the word disorder because societally it sounds really negative. A disorder, bad. Well, disorder simply just means dis as in different and order as in how things are typically done. So it's different from the ordinary. When you break the word down like that, it doesn't really sound that bad. But I do appreciate that in the way that people talk about it, it's not positive. Some people call it a condition. Now, heads up, I'm going to be calling it disease today. And before you say, I don't think autism is a disease, but from a science perspective, those words are typically used when it comes about researching what is going on. So not my words, science's words, but just be prepared. Now, to really define what autism is, we need to have some sort of group understanding. And today we're going to be looking at the DSF, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Already it's in a book called Mental Disorders, but we always say that autism and mental health are separate. So you can see how we're already getting a little bit of blur. So they describe autism as persistent deficits in social communication. So persistent meaning ongoing, deficits as in not to the same level as the typical person. And social communication, how we interact with human beings and the world around us. So this is verbal and non-verbal, language and eye contact. Another big part of autism is also social interaction. This could be developing and maintaining relationships. So we've got quite different things that make up a diagnosis. And this might be restricted, repetitive, patterns, behavior, interest, activities. So autism already is really, really wide. And I think we're going to have to narrow it down further if we really want to understand what it is. You try working out when you're looking at the brain, which is ridiculously tiny in like ourselves, what is causing any one of these things. You're going to have a hard time. And on here, I want you to put a pin with, where you think, you know, are the characteristics or conditions which you most resonate with. And this is essentially how we look at autism. So if you see here, the blue, the dark blue, is the core autism symptoms. These are your bare necessities when it comes to diagnosing autism. Do you have language impairments? Check. Social deficits? Check. Repetitive behavior? Check. You probably have autism. But if you have, say, sleep deficits, mood, anxiety, hyperactivity, attention, these are associated with neurological issues. So remember how we often talk about co-occurring conditions. These are ones which they aren't the foundation of autism, but they do go with autism. Then we've got the gray ones, which are associated system systemic issues. So anxiety, these are like, these are more how we interact with the world. They also come part and parcel. And lastly, related conditions. So you're not necessarily going to have OCD. You certainly don't have to have ADHD. But as we know, a lot of us do have multiple you can also, for instance, get seizures and intellectual disabilities, but do know that these are higher likelihood. They're definitely not part or guaranteed. So the dark blue is what we're going to be looking at today. Oh, April says, I most likely to experience social deficits and anxiety. I can also have trouble sleeping at the moment. And this is the thing, there will be some that you've more than others. But if you just have one and not the all three, it's typically unlikely you're going to get an autistic diagnosis. You normally have to have all three and they all have to be persistent. So ongoing, not just for a short period of time. All right. And for the big question, 
And this is where I get to see how much you're all switched on today. Do you know what patho... It's a very long word. So anyone, pathology, sociology. I probably butchered it. Oh, Louise, can you grow out of them? No, you can't grow out of it because as we all learn, it's literally part of your DNA. It's part of your makeup. It is essentially tied to who you are. So you can't grow out of it, but you can learn coping strategies. Oh, Emma says, aren't they now saying that autism made HD are one of the same? Well, some people think it is because when we, as we look into it, we'll realize that there's a lot of similarities, but there are also differences. In my personal opinion, I think they're all different. That's why we call it spectrum because everyone's different, but the overlap and the similarities are far greater than I think we've given it credit for previously. So, okay, what we got here, we got patterns in psych symptoms. Yes. So we're looking at patterns, mind, body, study, nice mind, body, the mental body. Okay. So I can see some recurring things here. Let's pull out your misery or maybe mine and find out what the, the experts say it is. So we're going back to studying disease related body changes. I did tell you we're going to be using the word disease today and you're like, oh, autism disease. I can see how that could make a lot of people uncomfortable. That is just what we're dealing with at the moment. So pathos equals suffering. Eee, that doesn't sound great. Then we've got physis equals natural and origin and logos. Logos equal the study of. So the study of suffering and the origin of suffering. This is, you know, it's, it's quite emotive, isn't it? But when we think of studying this for autism, we are essentially looking at the origin to why people suffer with certain conditions. Now, I fully appreciate autism isn't all pain and suffering, but there definitely are parts which can make life more challenging. And the idea that it is something which can be beneficial is still a relatively new one. I thought pathology. I really struggle with pronouncing that. Oh, well, we'll, uh, well, we'll continue as we mean to go on with poor pronunciation. So now that we know what it is, that is what we're looking at today. Do we know why people have autism and do we know why some people really struggle with it, arguably even suffer? Well, April says, yeah, it is processes associated with disease or injury. Typically, yes, but we can also use that same language for autism. But I, I guess it's not a one for one. Okay, pathos physiology. Is that right? Patho pathophili patho oh. I promise you I know what I'm talking about, even if I can't read things. Did I mention I have dyslexia? Yeah, I do. So autism is a disease, oh, sorry, is a disorder of brain development. Do you think this is true or false? This is up to you, whether or not you think it is or not. Evidence suggests that early brain development differences could be a factor in autism. Absolutely. So autism comes from the very early stages from when you are still in your mummy's tummy all the way to like the very early stages. So we do know that it is about brain development. So yeah, that's, we know that at least now. Autism isn't something you develop later on in life. It's very much something that you are diagnosed with very early on and it's likely it's with you from early stages. How do we know this? Well, we wanted to see if there's any differences. How do you know if someone has autism or do not have autism? Or if we're getting caveman style, you can actually tell by the brains. Have anyone ever called you a brainiac or saying, oh, you got a big brain? You actually do. People with autism have bigger brains. <laughs> and it's really interesting. So this graph here shows you. So when we're like a newborn, you know, maybe just born, our brains develop way faster than our neurotypical peers. And you'll see that by the age of two, our brains are quite bigger. We have, but then interestingly, it plateaus and by 16, it balances out again. So it's not like our brains are consistently larger. And again, I'm not talking like massive, you know, it's, it's a small difference, but it is a difference, but it normals out. So what is happening in that time? 67% more prefrontal neurons in ASD children. So you have more brain cells in the early stages. I think this is really interesting. 
So we know that autism is a real thing. This isn't some made up concept. We can actually see it when we look at people's brains. This is a, a basic way of looking. So I think we need to get a little bit more modern and to go down deeper. So autism is a brain development disorder. New studies, and I mean, they are quite new still, has shown that the brain structure is different in autism. And as from young adolescence to early teenage years, there is a significant change. So this is something which we can't really get around on. Scans reveal differences between autistic and non-autistic brains. This might mean that while there aren't copy in the future, at the moment we rely on psychology to observe, but soon that may no longer be the case. Oh, huh? April said a nice little, I'll read what April said because it's interesting. She says, not autism related, but I remember an episode of Hey Arthur, or was it just called Arthur? Episode where George discovered he is dyslexic. Mr. Ratburn, the rat teacher, has trouble reading George's story and asks him if he has been tested for dyslexia. George asks if dyslexia is dangerous and if he will die. Mr. Ratburn assures George that dyslexia is not a disease. And that is the same with autism. It isn't something you're going to die from. It's a different way of processing information. Oh, it's beautiful. Yes, I was thinking of Hey Arthur. <laughs> Thanks, April. So let's look at some studies that go more into the brain, like looking at like MR fMRI. So if we were to actually look at the brain here, you'll see that they've done some tests and some studies all the way back in 2009 to check the thickness of the brain layer from 10 to 60. And they compared it to those with typical brains and the warmer colors show areas changing the most over time. So as you can see here, the red does shift and throughout our life, the thickness of our brain layers does change. And this again is really interesting because I know some people think, you know, with psychology, because it's not something tangible, not something you can hold or visibly see, that maybe it's just something which is created in order to give people's labels. Whereas we now know that autism is something which can be studied on a neuroscience level. So interesting research, still early days, but it's not too far down the line to think that AI might be able to diagnose autism just through looking at brain scans. I don't know if you think that's a good or a bad thing. I think it brings a lot of different things into question, but that's definitely the route we're heading in. So what are some of these brain changes? Brain changes in autism. Studies show brain functions and structures change in autism. Early brain activities can hint at future language skills in autism. So we could, for instance, look at a brain scan and depending on the activity and the structural changes, you could predict if someone is going to have difficulties with language later in life. Now that could be quite a useful thing, right? Because quite often we leave it far too late to get speech therapy or support in school for children. If we can get it early on, yay, we can probably support someone and give them the right strategies. So the future is looking promising. Now here are some examples of brain scans. And what they did, they did some good old scans of a sleeping baby and they reacted to speech while they were asleep. So baby is asleep, someone's talking to the baby. Baby's not listening, but they wanted to see if there was any activity. And they found that kids with issues showed almost no early brain activity. Okay, issues is a bit of a strong word here, but let's say kids who have non-typical neurology showed less activation. So in a typical toddler, you'll see that the colorfulness is when the brain is activating. Now, with autism, with those with good language outcomes, you'll see that while there is definitely outcome, it is not as strong. So the, the, the yellow is like really strong reactions. Now, those with ASD who have poor language, when they eventually grow a bit more up, no activation tool or very little. So it's again, there are changes and these can be seen. You might be asking, well, why don't we do fMRI for everyone? is really really expensive and also maybe not the safest for everyone unless you really need to do it so it's why we're not doing it for everyone yet but it definitely has been proposed there looks like activation in different areas too yes yeah, somewhat but it's more like as if you see the activation is in the same place it's just that it's more 
splurged out. But I couldn't it, tell you any more information about these images, but I think it, it shows... It looks like there's some activation towards the, well, towards the front as well. Yeah, you little... do see they're like there. Now again, yeah. the red is, is less activation, but still activation. Whereas, where in a typical toddler, it doesn't seem to be any activation there. Now, I don't know how much we should take these photos for like complete facts, just because they're not really that high res. I think it's more about giving an over idea. But I think you'd have to look at like the paper that this originally came from to see if that is the case. But yeah, it definitely looks that way. So we can see that there are a lot of studies being done and a lot of studies are coming up with the same thing. There are differences in those who are likely to be diagnosed with autism than those who are not. But what do we think actually causes the change to happen? Is it option one? Is it option three? Or is it genetics? Okay, I'll give you a clue because I fudged this one up. It is genetics. That is what causes the brain to change. Now, it's not just genetics. It could also be environmental factors, but genetics seems to be one of the key ones because environmental factors affects genetics. I don't know how that one slipped away from me. Oh, well. So let's look into genetics. ASD, autism spectrum disorder, is highly genetic. This is why if your child has it, the likelihood of you having it is significantly higher. There's also a lot of things that if a twin has it, the other twin, I think is like 90% likely to have it as well. So it goes without saying that we know it's genetics. We don't always know exactly where in the genetics it originates from, but we know genetics is a strong factor. So there's things that we do have and things we don't know. Now, I want to know in your family, how many people do you know that have autism? Particularly if you have autism, maybe this is more relevant to you. And it will be interesting to see if you think, is it zero, one, two, three? If I was to talk about autism and ADHD, you know, we're, we're, we're reckoning into the double digits. Okay, my brother Adam. Oh, I'm sure that's you, April. One diagnosis, four suspected. And, you know, you might, it can skip generations. So for instance, your grandparents might well have autism, but you would have never have known. So do not be surprised. Okay, here we are. Yes, I got my stats right. Up to 90% match rate in twins shows strong sign that autism plays a role in genetics. Twins are really useful because genetically, very similar. And it shows that you are nearly guaranteed that if you've got one twin of autism, the other one will as well. Remember, like. April, are you a twin or is your brother a different age? But yeah, if one identical twin has autism, there's a high chance the other one too. It does have to be identical though. So remember that. Aaron says they aren't diagnosed and talking to your parents, but they have similar experiences. And that is a key thing. You know, a diagnosis isn't a, a science. It's more of an art at the moment. And that's why a lot of people don't get diagnosed because not everyone has access to it and there isn't that consistency which we would ideally like to see. Okay, sorry, you're not twins, my bad. So in some studies that was done in Sweden, they found that there was gene changes in two autism-related proteins, neuroligogen and neuroligin, neuroligin uh, three and four. So proteins are just what's in your body. They're, you know, they're in your cells, your DNA. And this is looking like maybe, possibly, could be the root cause of autism. Now, do any of you get what this is? Like, I'm, you don't need to fully understand what proteins are. I don't expect you to have ever have heard of what neuroligin is. But as long as you get the rough concept of it, we're good to move on. Okay, two, I'm happy enough with that. If you're not sure, hold on tight and hopefully I'll be able to break it down further. So before we get on to what the mrrk is neuroligin, a quick recap. Autism is definitely influenced by genes. We know that. One autistic child ups the next child's rate up to one in five. So if you know, if one, of, if one sibling has autism, the next one has a much higher likelihood. Identical twins are nearly guaranteed to both have autism if one has autism. And neuroligin, three and four, these are just types of genes. They are found in those with autism. 
So if we see like changes between that and to those who do not have autism, this is something which is cropping up time and time again. But what exactly is a neuroligand? So neuroligands are proteins at the spot where the brain cell connects. Remember at the start, I talked about this synapse where you see here where the, where the, the neurons connect to each other. In between that little gap here is the proteins. And this is where we're likely to find the neuroligands. It's where they hang out. So now we've got that. Let's dive even deeper. And this is a really zoomed in version of and the post synapse. And the neuroligon is essentially this little protein here. And it is always can nearly, it's like, it's like its best friend, let's say, is a neurorexin. So these two are the ones we're going to be really looking at. It is a brain protein, perfectly natural, and it can help make brain cells link. So essentially it helps with the communication and the talkity talkity. It works with other proteins. So we saw here, this is like the neurorexin is, it's like work buddy. You know, they don't always go home together, but they work very close together. And they're on the other side of these links. So these are the things which we notice tend to have differences in those with autism. Keep that in mind. It will come in handy. Now, there's this hypothesis, which is the leading one called common disease, common variant hypothesis. And this is asking ourselves, is autism a super rare? Is it this one gene to rule them all? Or is it lots and lots of little genes that are super common? And the idea is that when we are searching for this one gene to explain autism, it doesn't exist. Autism is not one thing, but many, many, many different things on a very, very common scale. But just a hypothesis, we're still trying to work it out. Now, I've given the answer away, but this is explained in a different way. So let's see if you can get the answer. Is autism monogenetic or a complex disease? So monogenetic is there is one reason why it is a thing and complex, meaning it could be many. Yes. OK, that's great. I'm glad that everyone was listening. So it is a complex disease. Now, again, sorry for the word disease, but that's what we're rolling with today. It's not what I would use on a day to day basis. So a monogenetic is predominantly DNA. And while there are other factors, so obviously like smoking, you know, other genetics, typically it is one gene, which is the key reason. Whereas autism is complex. It isn't saying that environment, not exercise, not looking after yourself isn't a contributing factor, but it is saying genetics is the predominant one. And it's also saying that it's not just one gene. It could be many, many different genes. This is why it is so, so difficult to pinpoint exactly where autism originates from, because it isn't as simple as, oh, it's that bit of biscotti in your brain. <laughs> it is many different bits of your DNA. So the common disease, common vari variant hypothesis, autism may come from many common gene changes, each adding a little bit of risk. Different disease from where one big change causes most of the risk. So we've got all our like DNA, right? And it might be, all right, there's a little bit of DNA there that's a little bit different to how others is. A little bit of DNA there that's a little bit different. A little bit of DNA that's a bit different. And you get lots of little changes. Tiny changes aren't going to do much. But when you have lots of little changes in your DNA that accumulate together, that is where people believe autism comes from. So when we often talk about how autism is so unique and different for everyone, we're not just trying to be inclusive. It's actually true. Autism is different for everyone because those little changes that are throughout are so, so different. Now, how do we actually know autism is a complex disease? We know what a complex disease is now, but where do we get this information from? Well, we look at something called SNPs, <laughs> SNPs. These are ways of looking at it. So there's been loads of studies called genome-wide association studies, and they look at lots of people's DNA and to see like things that are similar, dissimilar. And SNPs, as you'll see here, these are the things that make it up. Our DNA is essentially broken down into like little letters, and we all have different letters. If certain small DNA changes are common in people with disease, they are linked to that illness. So let's say, I don't know, Parkinson's, we'll look at the DNA. And if loads of people who we have diagnosed with Parkinson's have very similar 
little changes, so similar differences in the SNPs, that's when we know that ah, that gene, that different, those changes are linked with that disorder. And that is how we know with autism, because a lot of people, well, everyone with autism has certain similar characteristics or certain similar changes. Okay, just want to make sure we're all on the same page. So again, G G as, or let's just say genome-wise association studies, so the research, and these are small changes in your DNA. And if they see them cropping up time and time again in individuals who we all agree that have a Z condition, that is when we know that it is associated. So we're not making this up. We have seen that lots of people with autism have lots of similar SNPs which are changed. And this is how they change, they compare it those with the condition and without the condition. So we're getting somewhere. See, for instance, this population has all has one little change. The general population, no perceived changes. But what are these changes? Well, this is where we're going way too detailed. But just in case you're interested, let's have a look at what is going wrong under the hood. 5P is not actually like a 5P lodged in the brain. It's just like, these is the name of what is commonly done a bit askew in the autistic brain. All right, what else have we got? What is going on in the brain? We've got everyone's favorite gene, 8KB from SEMA 5A. <laughs> I have no idea what that is, by the way, but it's these are the things that we are looking at. And we've got one more, which is a gene to keep an eye out on. M-A-C-R-O-D-2. If these genes mean nothing to you, do not worry. But these are the type of things which scientists are looking into. So some early studies have found three possible linked gene types. However, other studies haven't been able to confirm this. This is why there aren't mega breakthroughs. Because some, gene, some studies found it, other studies did not find it. Common gene types didn't seem to increase the risk of autism. Common gene types didn't seem to increase the risk of autism much. So the genes that we are expecting, the ones that come into contact every day, we didn't see much of a correlation. You can see how we're still, basically, we still don't know. But the, the research is interesting. So researchers used a new way to look at DNA changes where parts are added or removed. Makes sense, right? So if you've got your DNA here, if we take some apart, is okay. autism still there? If we re-add it back, does autism reappear? And that's what they're doing. So they use the tool for this. There's this tool called the CGH, and it's, it's, it's a long old one. Microray-based comparative genomic hydrodism. I'll just give up when I read. Now, when these tests, what they're doing is they're looking for copy number variations. So we look for essentially uneven changes. When you look at someone's DNA and how it changes over time, if the changes are consistent, all good. If the changes are uneven, now that might be an area to research. It's important to know, though, that you can have changes in your DNA, but if another area changes and counteracts it, like levels it out, then it doesn't even show up on these tests. So these tests aren't perfect, but they give you a general idea on how often and how frequently someone's DNA is duplicating or being deleted and whether or not there might be complications in that. So a little bit more on CNVs, the copy number variant. CNVs are either DNA deletions or duplications. Now, it's perfectly normal for our DNA to delete and duplicate. Essentially, that's all it does. It's always duplicating. And if we get some bad apples in the bunch, it will delete it. That is very normal. Now, if we want to like, you know, talk about cancer, because a lot of people are a bit more familiar about that, essentially it's when the DNA has something bad in it and that keeps duplicating, duplicating, duplicating. Autism cancer are different, but you can see the relationship on CNVs in that. They can remove or add copies. Now, ideally, they're only copying the good genes and they're deleting the bad genes. That's not always the case. There's some tests that can help find this. But what is most important, that there was a test that 8% of kids with autism have had new CNVs. So when we mean new CNVs, it means that they've got new strands in their DNA, which were not in their parents. 
compared to 2% of their brothers and sisters without autism. So it's really interesting that while we do mention that autism is hereditary, there are also new genes which are copied that weren't there previously. But where do we find these CNVs? Where are we even looking? CNVs in autism can affect many different parts of our DNA. And this is a fact because our DNA is, there's so much of it and it's so, so tiny. It's like a needle in a haystack finding out exactly if we get rid of one, what is the repercussions? It is nearly impossible, or at least with our current understanding and technology. But maybe, for instance, AI might be able to solve that. This means that one gene is never going to tell us the whole story. There really isn't a holy grail of autism. Autism is many, many different things in many, many different ways. All right, I hope you're all doing okay. I appreciate this is a bit challenging and I'm probably butchering my explanations, but as long as we're following enough. Synapse-related genes in ASD. So remember, the synapse is where one neuron connects with the other neuron, and this is where we're going to be looking at. So CNVs change gene copies. So these pesky CNVs, they are essentially, imagine you've got a photocopier and someone like puts some sand in your photocopier and then it ruins it. That is essentially what is happening. It's messing up the copies. They can affect the connections. So when one, one synapse talks to the next or dendrite, the connections are getting skewed. Imagine you've got a telephone line and someone is busy cutting your cable. The connection's not going to be as strong. This hints that nerve connections are key in understanding autism. So when we talk about nerves, these are the, the, what's in your brain. Lots and lots of nerves, lots and lots of nerves. These are where we're looking at when it comes to autism. Very similar to ADHD. Now, what are these risks? So if we do have these changes, these are copy number variant. Okay, some big DNA changes explain 5 to 10% of autism risks. But smaller changes we can't see yet could also be important. So as you can see here, there are some massive changes that, okay, maybe if you got a bit of that, a bit of that, okay, we can see certain changes, but the vast majority is just far too small for our current technology. But this is hopefully an area which is going to expand and grow. If you take away anything from this is that we know way more than we've ever known ever, but there is still so much more still to learn. So let's look at the whole sequencing. 12 studies found that DNA changes linked to autism, especially in genes related to nerve connections. So say this is your whole genome. Your genome is like your DNA and within your DNA, you have little sections like an apple being cut in a bit. And it's in one of these sections where we think has a strong connection to autism. So like DNA is the, the whole apple. And the bit that we're looking for is one thin, thin slice of the apple. All right, let's summarize this quickly because this is getting, we're, we're out of our depth here. <laughs> we're talking about how DNA change, changes like the CNV and tiny changes found in these studies can affect autism. So really tiny changes equal autism. Studies include on twins have essentially proven that genetics and genes do play a part in autism. So there are things that we are 100% sure of, but in terms of the real exact reason, still ongoing. Brain structures and activities also differ in autism. We also know that the brain is literally bigger in the early stages. We know that there's more or less activation in the brain in certain studies. And while they give us a lot of clues where the origin of autism originates from, it still doesn't give us the exact information. We are so near to solving that puzzle, but that last section is a mammoth task, but it's definitely one that I think likely will solve in the next decade or two. All right. Any questions on what I spoke about today? And I'll try my best to answer them. If not, I'll get back to you. I fully appreciate today has been quite a heavy subject and by simplifying some of the areas, it may have confused some areas. You tell me. But the sessions that we're doing in the, in the coming weeks are all about going further into cutting edge re research and trying to work out what is autism. And in my personal opinion, the more we understand autism, the more we can accept autism, the more we realize that it, what it is on a fundamental level really helps. 
a lot of people still don't believe it's a real thing. And with science, we can prove that it is. The evidence proves it, it backs it up. We have enough evidence now to say that it's definitely due to genetics. We also have enough evidence to know that what part of our DNA in the synapses that are most likely responsible. We also know what proteins are likely responsible, but we don't know for a fact. We don't know if that's the whole story. We don't know if there are other elements that are too, too small for us to observe that may also play a key part. All right. Oh, Anna says, sorry, a bit of a tricky question, but does autism have anything to do with a method of conception? Do you know what, Anna? I do not know the answer to that, to be honest with you. But I do know that, for instance, if you are a parent and you smoke or you're in a polluted area, the likelihood of your child having autism can be higher. So we do know it's genetic. We also know it's environmental and we also know like hereditary. As to all the actual conception, I've never heard anything to suggest that, to be honest with you. But I will never say never because I can't read every report ever. But it's an interesting question. I'm so glad we're done on this one. <laughs> so the next week, we are going even, even deeper down the rabbit hole, looking at the origins. So today we looked at what autism is in a more wider approach. Where What is the likely reason why autism is a thing? Now we're going to be looking at about why these variations or why these SMPs, these SNPs are changed in the first place. And I think this is going to be really interesting. So who was the first person to have autism? Why do the genes make these copy areas? That's what we're going to be exploring. So do check out our Eventbrite, click the little link, sign up the way that you signed up to this one, and hopefully you'll find some new things. Oh, Gregory says that episode was more fun than it had right to be. <laughs> nice. Now, if you thought this was interesting and you're like, I would love to learn more or nah, this was cool, but I have no idea what a synapse is. I don't know what we're talking about or this brain malarkey. Do go on our YouTube channel because we have videos which explain the basics of neuroscience, which could be a really strong foundation in order to understand this one better and also our following ones. Oh, Louise says, thanks so much. I love these weekly webinars. See you next week. See you, Louise. Emma, the first guy to be diagnosed only died recently, if I remember rightly. Oh, I didn't know that. But it makes sense because they would be pretty old by now. Yeah, I say recently. I feel like when I was, I've was, i been doing like research into my course or something, I feel like I've come across that, that within the past 10 years or something, the first yeah. guy that was diagnosed in the 40s, he's like recently you know, like relatively recently died. I'd have to look at like not the exact dates up, but I'm sure I've come across that recently. So that that and does that, ring a that does ring a bell. Um, and it just shows you how new we are in the diagnosis process that the, you know like we're still within like one lifetime of Yeah, no, definitely. It, it's it being really up. new. It, it, like, it, again, I've, we've got a whole webinar series on the history of autism and you know, it's even like post World War II. We are, we are still learning so much. All right. Anyway, here's the contact details. Get in contact if you want to. And do check out next week. I think, you know, these sessions, they are a bit more theory, maybe less 100% factual, but they're really interesting if you want to learn the cutting edge about where scientists are currently putting their efforts and their research into. Also quite good for ethical discussions. Is this even an area which we think we should be learning to? And if we do learn the answers, what then? All right, nice. Well, we are done there, but thank you everyone so much for your lovely comments and for your participation today. It seems quite sunny in the UK at the moment, so do enjoy the weather if you're around here while it lasts. Well, thanks everyone, and I will see you very shortly. Well, I'll see you next week. All right, bye everyone.